Hi, I'm Heather Marie Montilla, and you are watching PBS Books. Thank you for joining us. PBS Books, in collaboration with Virginia Public Media, is pleased to host a conversation with trailblazing authors Leslie Penelope and Lucinda Roy in celebration of the 2022 Library of Congress National Book Festival. PBS Books is a proud partner of the Library of Congress to promote their 2022 National Book Festival. Let's take a moment to hear from the Librarian of Congress, Dr. Carla Hayden. Books bring us together as the Library of Congress National Book Festival returns in person on September 3rd at the Washington Convention Center. The festival is free for readers of all ages. We will also be live streaming three stages for audiences across the country. Featured authors this year include Janelle Monet, Leslie Jordan, Niall DeMarco, Nick Offerman, Angie Thomas, and more. So go to loc.gov bookfest for more. If you live in Virginia or just traveling distance from the Library of Congress from Washington, D.C., don't miss the LOC. Library of Congress National Book Festival on Saturday, September 3rd from 9 a.m. to 8 p.m. The festival is free and it is open to everyone. The complete schedule for the 2022 Library of Congress National Book Festival can be found at loc.gov slash bookfest. But if you can't be there in person, you can stream it live and you can curate your own experience from the comfort of your home. Now through August 31st, PBS Books and PBS stations across the country will host a series of 10 virtual events with 11 authors. They will also be available on demand on PBS Books and the National Book Festival website. Well, today's conversation focuses is on two authors, Leslie Penelope and Lucinda Roy. Leslie is the author of The Monsters We Defy and Lucinda Roy is the author of Flying the Coop. Both will discuss their work, their dedication to creating strong, empowered female heroines and their involvement in the, the Library of Congress National Book Festival. So we're so glad you're here, but before we begin, we always like to thank our library partners, 1800 Strong across the country, as well as numerous PBS stations who share this very important content with all of you. Most importantly, we'd like to thank you for joining us. So thanks for coming. Well, now the moment you've been waiting for, it is my extraordinary pleasure to introduce Leslie Penelope. Leslie has been writing since she could hold a pen and loves getting lost in the worlds in her head. She is an award-winning fantasy and paranormal ro romance author. Her novel, Song of Blood and Stone, was chosen as one of the time, one of time's 100 best fantasy books of all time. Equally left and right-brained, Penelope studied filmmaking and computer science in college and sometimes dreams in HTML. <laughs> she hosts the My Imaginary Friends podcast and lives in Maryland with her husband and furry dependents. Her latest book is the one we'll be discussing, The Monsters We Def Defy, and it is also featured in the Library of Congress National Book Festival. Welcome, Leslie. Thanks so much for having me. It's great to be here. I was so glad to have you. Well, to join the conversation, we, we are so fortunate to have another trailblazing author, Lucinda Roy. Lucinda Roy is an award-winning novelist, poet, and memorist, and a lifelong advocate for diversity and inclusion. Currently teaching as a distinguished professor at Virginia Tech, she has lived and taught on three continents and recognized for her keynotes on race and gender, creative writing and education reform. Her commentaries and poetry have been published in numerous newspapers and journals, including USA Today, The Guardian and The New York Times. She lives with her husband in Virginia and 
She currently teaches, as mentioned, at Virginia Tech. For the freedom race, she relocated to speculative fiction because it allows her to imagine what form hope would take inside a damaged future world. Roy's latest novel, Flying the Coop, is featured at the 2022 Library of Congress National Book Festival. Welcome, Lucinda. Thank you, I'm so pleased to be here. I'm really excited. Well, we're so excited to have both of you and to guide today's conversation. We're so fortunate to have Angie Miles. Hello, welcome. Thank you so much. Hello, Heather. Hi. So you are, you're from Virginia. Uh, you're one of the most experienced broadcast journalists known for your decades of anchoring um, at WTVR, CBS 6, and WWBT, NBC 12 in Richmond, and reporting at WRI, excuse me, WVIR in Charlottesville, as well as WV. PT in Harrisonburg. You founded the literacy nonprofit called Happy Reading, which is very funny because I end all of my conversations with Happy Reading, and you've taught broadcast news at Virginia Commonwealth University. You hold two degrees from University of Virginia, um, a BA in communications, an MA in education, and you have deep connections across Virginia. We are thrilled to have you. You currently anchor and host VPN's News Focal Point. Welcome. Thank you Thank for being you. here. Thank <laughs> you so much, Heather. I am steeped in books and steeped in journalism and delighted and elated to be here with you all today. So why are you so happy to be with us today? Well, there are a number of reasons. I'll just uh, tick off a couple. One is that um, I believe that literacy is the solution to pretty much every problem we have in society. And um, whether that means we are learning, we're developing our empathy, whether it means we're sharpening our skills of imagination, spending time with others, um, reading together and building relationship, it, it's the solution to pretty much everything. I'm also thrilled because of the importance of libraries. Um, someone said not long ago that we don't need libraries because we have bookstores and everyone can afford a book. Well, that may be the case that everyone can afford a book, but a library opens books, um, gives access to people to every book, not just one book. So I'm thrilled about the Library of Congress's work and to be part of this discussion in advance of the festival. Well, in the festival, the theme is books bring us together, right? And I think that is perfect because as we think of libraries across our great nation and across Virginia, libraries are community hubs or community centers. During the pandemic, they got information to people. They made sure people still got books that they were able to read, that they had access to information. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yes, I, I couldn't agree more. Libraries, yes, they give us books, but they give us so much. And the Library of Congress, I think an example of how they bring people together is by having every year hundreds of thousands of people go every year to the, the National Book Festival Library of Congress um, for the you know, for this moment. Um, and the great thing is if you live in Virginia, it's probably in driving distance, right? Mm -hmm. And and so this year it's always on, you know, as in former years, except for the last few years with COVID, it is the Saturday before Labor Day weekend. So tell me, are you planning to go or what are your thoughts? Well, how, could I not, how could I not go? <laughs> you know, it's, a, it's such a, it's, it's a huge event. It's an exciting event. It's an opportunity for people to meet their favorite authors or to discover who their next favorite authors will be. Um, and I think that that um, is really part of why we're having this discussion today too, because for those who don't know these um, talented women authors we'll be discussing uh, books with today, they might want to get to know them. They'll be glad they did. Well, on that note, it seems appropriate that I turn over the conversation for you to get everyone to get to know these amazing authors. So without further ado, enjoy the conversation and I'll see you at the end. Thank you, Heather. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for being here. So 
We are, as you know, hello, ladies. Hello, welcome to uh, the discussion. Hi, uh, thank you. So Great. we're talking with Lucinda Roy, and we're talking with Leslie, uh, Leslie, Leslie Penelope. I uh, couldn't get it out there for just a moment. And I'm so happy to see both of you. Um, I think that a central theme for this conversation we're launching is about trailblazing. And I think that both of you actually fit that bill. Uh, we had an introduction by Dr. Carla Hayden with the Library of Congress, the first black person, the first woman, a black woman to hold that, that title, a trailblazer. Um, in recent days, we have mourned the loss of Michelle um, Nichols, who of course was Uhura in the Star Trek movies or series rather. And uh, she was a trailblazer who inspired many people. And so here I am with two trailblazers. I'm wondering who inspired you? Who were the trailblazers who you looked to in determining that you would become authors and that you would tell the types of stories that you tell? Well, you know, uh, in many ways, I, this is honestly the truth. The, the greatest trailblazer for me in some ways was my local library. And that was because I was so poor growing up. We didn't have a refrigerator, we didn't have a bath, that kind of thing. And so we didn't have hot water, didn't have heat except in one room, but I could go walk to the library and I could find in there these amazing books. So I have to say that, that uh, participating in the National Book Festival on September 3rd means so much to me personally because I feel as though they allow people who are economically poor to feel culturally rich. And I also think something that's so important right now is there has never been a time when courage is more important. And I feel as though librarians and booksellers are like the courageous custodians of culture. And so for me, that's why this is just very personally important. Courageous custodians of culture. I love that. And how appropriate. Do you agree, Leslie? Is that an appropriate way to describe their jobs? Oh, absolutely. Librarians are foundational to so many authors. You know, I grew up reading. Um, reading was a great escape for me. I, um, I just, I loved going to the local library, taking out as many books as I could. And I read pretty widely across different genres growing up. Um, and yeah, it was it just fed me so much. And in terms of authors, you know, as a child, I was reading, uh, sometimes I was reading, you know, authors like, or books that were maybe a little too advanced for me, but, but authors like Virginia Hamilton um, and even Toni Morrison, who I read a little younger than I probably should have, were just black women authors writing either slightly speculative or stories of, you know, our world just through a different lens, um, just, took my imagination and, you know, broadened it, broadened the things that I could see and imagine. And yeah, I, I also had wonderful experiences at libraries growing up and um, you know, attribute that to me wanting to be an author. I'm feeling very much in your club right now because uh, that was my experience too. In fact, um, I grew up in a little town called Powhatan at the time I was um, very young, we didn't have a public library at all. So I had a relative who would bring books to me from the public library in Richmond and then take them back you know, in a couple of weeks once I'd read them. But I too loved to read lots of different genres. Um, you mentioned Virginia Hamilton, what a fantastic writer. And in my work as a literacy educator, I've recently had the opportunity to introduce some young people to her work. Dreer House was something that I read uh, with some young uh, African-American girls uh, over the last few months. Um, and I think um, it would be not a risk to say Virginia Hamilton would be proud of both of you for the works that you are creating. Let's talk about those specifically. So assuming that people are not familiar with your current work, could you give us a little book talk, one minute or less? Uh, Ms. Roy, start with you um, on what this book is about and why everyone should read it. Um, I, I tried to come up with a, a really kind of short description. And for me, this book and this whole series, because it's a trilogy, is about this. Um, I didn't want to write about why the cage bird sings. I wanted to write about how the cage bird flies. And in many ways, this 
whole series is about that. It's about the, the flying Africans legends, the idea that, that people who were in, enslaved could suddenly rise up and uh, find freedom. But it's also about the current situation and how racial tensions seem to be tearing the country apart. So flying the coop is set in DC for the most part, uh, which seems very appropriate because of the National Book Festival. Uh, and uh, there is a kind of a division in the country. It has been trifurcated. And the middle of the country is secessionist and segregationist. And the out, outer parts, the super states and lots of the urban areas are not. They are liberty areas. And it's the tension that arises when a young girl and two of her friends decide that they are going to try and escape from captivity and what that means. So could you talk a little bit about your protagonist? What, um, what led you to ascribe particular characteristics to your characters? Uh, what, what, what did your protagonist need to have, do or be to really carry this story? That's such a good question, honestly. And I think in many ways, what my protagonist needed, and maybe Leslie will agree with this, uh, she needed courage. She needed to be kind of fearless, but also fearful. Because unless you have some fear, you're an idiot. So you have to be able to be both fearless and, and also aware of your surroundings in such a way that you can be intelligent. And so she's also, she's a real reader. She has these coverts these books that she hides because she's not meant to have books and she takes them out secretly and reads them and it changes who she is, even though culturally they're very different from who she is. Um, and so that fearlessness and a sense of humor, I honestly think that my mother got us through all kinds of things from, from really being very poor to terrible racism that we often endured. And it was because she had a sense of humor. She'd make us laugh. And we'd go on the, on Clapham Common in London and we'd pretend to be trees. And everybody would think we were absolute morons and idiots. But she wouldn't <laughs> care because we were having so much fun. So that sense of humor and that fearlessness, I think, are two of the qualities that, that I really value. It sounds like she has qualities that maybe you also embody or that were a represent that represent people you have known and loved um, yeah. over the years. But could, tell us a little bit more about the plot. I mean, we don't want to give away everything, but what is the central uh, struggle in the story and and what um, what kinds of things happen that would lead someone to be intrigued enough to pick up this book and read it? Well, by the time we open flying the coop, um, Jellybean Gigi Lottemule, who is the, the protagonist in the book, the main protagonist, is living in D.C. and is living in hiding because uh, uh, she has escaped from a planting and also because a transformation has taken place in her a metamorphosis so that she is unlike a human in a way. She is a hybrid creature. And there is something about that that really relates to being um, a flying African. And there are things, therefore, that she has to try and uh, uh, achieve and uh, try to make sure that she can help to free the other people who are there on planting still. One of the things that was really important in the book was I had to really think about the political situation. I actually do believe that we could very well reinstitute slavery if we're not careful. But the, one of the reasons why we'd have to do it is because we would have to um, uh, re kind of classify people. So there are people who are imported from the cradle from Africa, where I lived and taught for a while, and they are called botanicals or seeds. And that allows the those who would oppress them to give them no legal rights whatsoever. And so that the struggle is to find oneself but it's also to find one's place in a disunited states, because that's what it's called now, that does, just does not really function in the way that it needs to. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's friendship, most of all, that brings them together and that belief in each other, because she has some very close friends and some wonderful mentors like Man Criday and others who really guide her along the way. And, uh, and gradually the novel the novel series um, becomes broader and broader. It starts with a real close up in the freedom race on Gigi Lottemule, and then it becomes a much 
broader kind of sense of what Virginia is and what DC is and what the Madlands are. And then in the final uh, volume that I'm writing right now, it's a really panoramic global view of the future. It sounds like Virginia is also a central theme today, not just our place, but there's another reference to Virginia Hamilton. Um, of course, The People Could Fly is Great. one of the things that fascinated her. So now we're all going to go back and read Virginia Hamilton after our discussion today. Um, but let's um, let's hear uh, also about um, the books, the book that you have written, uh, Leslie. What What is it that people need to know? If you were giving a little book talk, enticing people to pick it up and read it, what would you tell us? So The Monsters We Defy was envisioned as a 1925 fantasy heist story that takes place in Washington, D.C. And I had never written a heist, but it's a genre that captures so many people's imagination. And I wanted to do something in the Harlem Renaissance era. And as I started to research, I realized Harlem has been done so much. I don't read enough books about D.C. And I grew up in Maryland. My mother's family is from Washington, D.C. So as I found the story and the characters through the real life research, everything just opened up. So the story is about a woman named Clara Johnson, who's actually based on a real life person. And my fictionalized version of her, she's in her early 20s. And she works for Carter Whitson's uh, Journal of Negro History as a typist, but she's also clairvoyant. She was born with a call, which is the, uh, the birthing sack. And in a lot of cultures, that means that you can see spirits so she can talk to ghosts. And she tries to ignore them uh, because they can be very difficult in her life. But she's also saddled with um, a, a debt to an enigma. So in this book, enigmas are spirits and they can give you a charm, which is a magical power, but it comes with a trick, which is the cost. And so many of the characters in the novel have both charms and tricks. And uh, so the Empress, which is the spirit that she's indebted to, gives her a task. She can get rid of the charm and the trick if she steals this magical ring from the finger of the most powerful black woman in the city, who's this opera singer named Madame Josephine. So it becomes a story about you know, gathering this crew of people together who all wanna get rid of their tricks and their arms in order to pull off this heist and steal this magical ring. And so it goes through, you know, DC, there's lots of historical figures that come into play. Uh, Carter Whitson is in the book. Uh, Langston Hughes shows up. I had a lot of fun peppering, you know, 1925 DC with the characters who were there at the time and, you know, these well-known figures and places that if you're in the area, um, you know, you'll recognize. And I really wanted to tell a story of the self-contained African-American community that was in Washington DC at this time. And so, we're in a, the backdrop is our world where racism is at play. Um, a, an, an event that takes place in the book in the background is the, the Ku Klux Klan march down Pennsylvania Avenue in 1925. So that's the setting. But I really wanted to tell a story that wasn't about racism. It's really about community. It's about these people who come together to save their community. And it's, it's, I was just intrigued by this idea that, you know, we had a self-sufficient community in all, all over the country. There were these small pockets and um, just exploring that and what it takes to, to help it thrive and um, to have these characters just go on this journey, have this, you know, magical heist that they are involved in, but also creating a found family and um, freeing themselves from these debts that they've taken on. Mm. It sounds like you have uh, elements of suspense, action, uh, in the story as well. Um, you mentioned that the protagonist is based on a real person. Are there other characters who draw on, again, uh, real people we might even be able to identify in the story? Aside from the actual names that you, you know, you'll recognize, the characters in the heist crew were, were based on a kind of archetypes. Um, so there's five main characters who are part of this crew. In addition to Clara Johnson, there's Israel Lee, who is a musician. And, um, he, you know, he was brought up, he went to Dunbar High School. You know, I have the whole thing where he's in the jazz age as a very popular jazz mus musician because of the charm and the, the debt that he's made to this enigma spirit. We also have Jesse Lee, who was a Pullman Porter, who was also a veteran of World War I. And so I did a lot of research on, you know, what did Black soldiers do? You know, most of, most of them, aside from the Harlem Hellfighters, were not allowed to actually fight in the war, but they still would come home potentially with trauma or PTSD. And that's Jesse Lee's story. Um, Aristotle is another character who is an older character. He was an actor. He was in vaudeville. And he has the experience of having to perform in blackface. 
and then um, Zelda, who is uh, was a circus performer. So she's a black character who was who was born with albinism, and a lot of these people, uh, you know, were either sold or coerced into circuses to become performers, mm -hmm. and you know, there's experiences of not being paid and being exploited, and so I took from often, you know, reading biographies of real life people that you know had some of these experiences or just drawing from their real world and and if, to create these fictional characters who have analogs and who i can point to and say okay if you had a grandfather great grandfather who was in world war one you know wanted to fight for his country but wasn't allowed to then maybe something of jesse lee you can find in you know in that character and so yeah they did a lot of research just to, to find real people and sometimes combining people and just finding their stories to, to combine and, and create something new. Yeah. I mean, it, um, I think that for, for um, both of these, both of these books, we are hearing about characters that we can relate to in some way. Someone in our family had a certain trait or a story that was passed down that we heard from time to time. And there are threads of that in what you have woven. Um, I, I, I want to, talk a little bit about the supernatural aspects, the, the, the things that, that make these stories um, more like fantasy or, or um, science fiction. What, what drew you to that? Why didn't you just write, you know, realistic fiction novel that kind of got across the points that you wanted to make? The same question for each of you. Yeah, that's a great question. And of course, because I'm a professor at Virginia Tech, it's the kind of question that you often get asked. Why would, it, would, you, would you not just stick with mainstream literary fiction, which is what I my first two novels were? Um, and I think one of the reasons why for me, and Leslie, you'll, you'll, I think, relate to this. It's so amazing to be able to write inside a genre that allows you to do anything. In, with sci-fi fantasy, there are actually no, no parameters, no boundaries. You can, if you want to have dragons and so on, you can do that. What I also understood about uh, as I was writing was that the readers of sci-fi fantasy are often the most tolerant and embracing of difference. And I do think that that's one reason why those of us who write in a, a way that's kind of non-traditional often gravitate towards that. On the other hand, I do have to say my writing is very much grounded in realism. I actually, I love realism. Uh, and I've always loved novels like Wuthering Heights, which is essentially a ghost story in many ways, and also a romance. But notice how she writes. And it seems to me that there's really no such thing as genre fiction, because everybody writes in a particular genre. There's either fiction that is formulaic, and follows certain rules so you expect certain things to happen, or there's fiction that doesn't do that, that challenges you. And so I couldn't think of a more urgent time to write about than now when we're really in turmoil. And it seemed to me therefore to write about race and write about difference and write about oppression and write about what it means to be a woman whose sexuality is denied and so on is really the most important thing to do right now because there's so much misunderstanding. Mm -hmm. I, I agree with uh, Lucinda that, you know, fantasy, why I chose to become a fantasy writer primarily is because it allows us to hold up a mirror to our world and show things about our world with, by but taking away some of the baggage so that you can reflect it, you can explore it in different ways via metaphor and also something that's very close. You know, my entire, you know, kind of all of my work is very socially conscious in the way that it explores things. But I are topics that are, you know, from police violence to, um, you know, sexuality and, and just discrimination of all kinds. And so I'm always confronting that in my work. But I do believe that by taking it away from the, the completely realistic and adding a layer of magic, either putting it in a secondary world or even like with the monsters we defy when it's in our world, just adding a layer of magic on it. It just allows people to see things in a different way and, and maybe open their mind to something that they haven't thought of in that way before. And I like what uh, Lucinda said about, how, you know, there's no parameters for fantasy. I, I, I use that, but also building the boxes. I talk about this in my podcast, like creating the boxes that your story is going to reside in allows you to expand the creativity. So 
I wanted to make sure this was 1925, as close as I could make it to our world by doing tons of research and then adding in a magic that's based on African-American folk magic, you know, that is based on real life things, stories that my grandmother told other other writers who were dealing with African folk magic, things like hoodoo. And um, incorporating those in and just kind of using my own lens to reflect the world that I see it and the themes that I'm interested in through this kind of fantastical, magical lens. And I, that really feels, you know, really relevant to me. And I feel like readers can can read the story and, and just have a different view than it would if I was completely realistic in writing just historical fiction. Okay, I wanna pause just a moment to let people know you're watching PBS Books. I'm Angie Miles with VPM News, VPM News Focal Point specifically. And we are talking with two fantastic fantasy, science fiction, across genres, writers, Lucinda Roy and Leslie Penelope. We are so pleased to have you here um, as we talk about your two newest works in advance of the National Book Festival, uh, the Library of Congress event that's happening Labor Day weekend. You will be there on Saturday, September 3rd to meet and greet and talk about the books. Uh, you also are part of this series, Books Bring Us Together, which you can find out more about if you go to the, uh, the website and if you continue to watch. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about your podcast. You mentioned it just now, but you're 200 episodes in and that theme of imagination, of um, getting outside our boxes, if you will, um, applies here. Talk about your podcast and how people can find that. Sure. I started the podcast uh, 2019, I believe. It's called My Imaginary Friends. And I had been blogging off and on, but mostly off. And I wanted to find another way to share my journey as a writer. You know, a lot of readers and other writers are interested in the behind the scenes look at life as a writer. Also because I am a hybrid author, which means I have a traditional publisher, but there's also some work that I self-published and I started self-published. And just giving my experiences with both sides of the publishing industry, sharing my knowledge about craft. And basically, it's just a weekly look behind the scenes where I discuss what's happening, the highs and the lows of the author life, um, when I'm working on a manuscript, the you know what problems I have craft-wise, how I solve some of those problems. I get feedback from aspiring writers and, and published authors alike that you know it's helpful in terms of seeing how someone else works through these issues. So it's both instructive, but it's also just sharing my thoughts. Um, sometimes I talk about if there's publishing news, things like that. So um, yeah, I just, I have fun with it and I like to have a record of what I was thinking about and how I do things. Mm. Uh, and you um, also are, are a series writer at this point. So maybe mention a little bit about your, your series work. My first series uh, was the Ersinger Chronicles. The first book, uh, Song of Blood and Stone, it was the one that was on Time Magazine's uh, list of uh, best 100 fantasy novels of all time. It also won an award from the Black Caucus of the American Library Association, which when it was self-published. So actually I started my career self-published with that novel and then eventually sold it to St. Martin's Press, a traditional publisher. And so it's a series of four novels and three novellas that are epic fantasy. They take place in an alternate 1920s world with magic, with, you know, the entire series is basically about uh, a country of people people that have magic and a country of people without that have been at war for 500 years. And it's a romantic fantasy. So there's, you know, lots of romance happening. People are falling in love with the absolute worst people for them. And the series is really concerning. Can these two groups of people ever find peace and live together harmoniously? And that's the series where I was tackling things like, you know, police violence and what it's like to, you know, be someone of a different race in a country where you're the minority and to have that sort of uh, you know, prejudice against you and just all of these, all of these kinds of social issues that I'm dealing with in that series, but it's fantasy and there's mag a magic system and it's adventure and love. And those are the types of things that I'm always trying to explore. And that is incredibly compelling to work through these real world issues in a place where you have removed the limits, right? You have expanded the possibility. And Lucinda, you've done essentially the same thing. And this new book, Flying the Coop, is also part of a series. Talk a little bit about the first book and where you think the series might go after this. 
you know, it's funny because I didn't necessarily, when I first began thinking about this series 15 years ago, I didn't necessarily think that it would turn out to be three huge books. They are long books. <laughs> um, but I have to say that um, what spurred it on and why I realized I needed to write it was I, I, I wrote an article for the journal The Hill uh, about the urban-rural divide. And it was so clear to me as you look at the map where you've got the, the, this blue center of Democrats and then you've got red all around it, that there was going to be tremendous tension. And just living here in Southwest Virginia in a rural area, that's another reason why I thought that this is, this is the future. This is something we really need to think about. And that's why on Flying the Coop on the front is the kind of demolition of the, of the Capitol building uh, by rioters. Um, and of course, I envisioned that long before January the 6th. Um, but as Leslie was saying, there's something very liberating about being able to tackle contemporary urgent problems inside a, a milieu, inside a, the kind of scenarios that allow you to, to break the conventions, that allow you to do things that are unexpected. So I would envision, for example, that young people could talk quite openly about having botanicals in a society and what that would mean and why uh, some people would come up with that system knowing how well it would work. Um, whereas if they were going to talk about the current situation, it would be incredibly difficult to do. My sense is that we've forgotten how to talk across race and that that's a very dangerous thing. We've got to learn to do that better. And if we don't, we'll be in real trouble. Um, so writing this trilogy has allowed me, though, to live with these characters who I've really got to know in ways I, I didn't think was even possible. So they are more real to me than, they're not more real than my husband. My husband's probably a bit more real. <laughs> but generally speaking, I hope he never watches this, but generally speaking, it's really true that these characters, Leslie, I'm sure you find it too, you're talking to them all the time. You're becoming them. Mm -hmm. I have a character called Afara in Flying the Coop, and she is an outcast, which is somebody on the lowest rung of the ladder. And she is she's, she's not even allowed to have a name. So she is known as Cloth 33H slash 437 because she came from planting 437. Mm -hmm. But her journey is extraordinary and the things that she discovers and the, and the way that she can speak across difference is really, I think, kind of remarkable. And that, that allowed me to make that journey as well. Yeah, I, I, um, I'm just getting a sense of, of other great works like The Giver, The Handmaid's Tale. Mm -hmm. I mean, we are, as readers, drawn to stories of people who are deemed less than or not having an opportunity to rise above oh. their place in a certain caste system. So um, I, I wonder if you could just speak to what that draw is, why we care so much about people who are, are not allowed the opportunity to rise or advance and how your book um, addresses that and gives us some sense of hope. Uh, I think that we've always done that, though. Leslie, I think you probably agree that if you look back in history, we've always found found a way to stratify people, to make sure that some people are the punching bags of others. And uh, I, I think that that's kind of a human trait and that one of the things that we've got to therefore do is stand back and look at ourselves now. I hope that the best books that are supposedly taking us away from reality actually take us closer to reality so that then we will say what are the examples where we can see what's happening to young women today for example look what's happening in, in afghanistan look what's happening in certain african countries look what's happening here uh, there's all kinds of things we need to be able to reflect back on and i do think that there are there are books that either confirm all of your assumptions or books that challenge your assumptions. And I think that both Leslie and I, 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 I hope that's okay to say Leslie, <laughs> uh, tr write books that challenge people's assumptions about where a narrative is going. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I do agree. I think that people are drawn to characters that they can relate to in certain ways. And if, if given the chance, I think a reader can relate to many different types of characters, but specifically if someone is like an underdog, like there's so much fiction written about underdogs and at their heart, characters who are marginalized in some way, who are fighting against a larger society that's more powerful, 
are underdogs and they they resonate with all of us you know no matter who you are you felt like an underdog at some point in your life and so I think that, um, yeah, that the characters that I write are always struggling against some power because that's interesting to read about, but it also allows me to explore things that I think that are wrong in the world and, and posit my ideas for solutions to those issues. Um, you know, in this book, Clara has a, a backstory that comes out that is very difficult and she has dealt with that in, in very specific ways. And so that she is uh, kind of a prickly character who doesn't trust easily because of her experiences. And, you know, you have people like that who you can instantly relate to, uh, regardless of if you've been through those same experiences. So, yeah, I think that, um, you know, being drawn to these uh, marginalized or underdog characters is just part of what makes fiction so exciting to read about and, and why uh, I really enjoy writing these kind of characters. I, I I keep coming back to something uh, that you're, you've been saying, um, Lucinda, about fantasy readers being intelligent and about how big your books are. Um, my husband, I, we've been married for over 30 years. I joke with him all the time that the only reason I married him is because he reads big books. And, <laughs> and truthfully, he is an avid fantasy and science fiction reader. So talking with you guys just is fantastic because it gives me Oh, no pun intended, fantastic. But it gives me um, some new material to share with him uh, for upcoming beach reads. And then we will be able to come to the Library of Congress, um, the National Book Festival, and chat with you guys about the, the books. What can people look forward to if they come to see you, if they choose to come to see you in D.C. Um, for this event? Well, I'm going to be in conversation with B.L. Blanchard, who's written The Peacekeeper. And so we have some, I think, I hope, some really interesting things to talk about the future, what, why we envisioned it certain ways. And, uh, and they're very contrasting novels in lots of ways, but also there's, there's this seam of similarity between them. So I think that that conversation, I'm hoping, will be really interesting. But there are so many great things that are going on at the National Book Festival. Kwame Alexander, who actually was a student at Virginia Tech, who's a brilliant, brilliant writer, children's writer, will be there too. And, and Bakari Sellers and so many wonderful writers are, are lined up. So uh, there'll be a feast, a literary feast, I think. And Kwame was also at one time, I believe, the the uh, PBS uh, or NPR Poet Laureate. So mm -hmm. <laughs> he's always fun to to uh, to talk with. Um, what about you, Leslie? I'll be in conversation with the author Tochi Anyabuchi, who is fabulous. And um, I write fantasy. He's written mostly sci-fi, but he writes fantasy also. And we'll be talking about place and creating a place and world building. And um, yeah, I, I'm really looking forward to that. We're also signing books there. So uh, there'll be a signing afterwards if you'd like to meet the authors. But, um, and, and Lucinda, I know B.L. Blanchard, we share an agent, and I'm excited for your chat with her and uh, both of your books. So yeah, there's, there's just gonna be, I think there's something for everyone, no matter what genre, um, you know, really well-known authors, authors that are new to you, that will be your next favorite authors. It will be a fantastic day. So I really hope people come out and enjoy it. Again, I mean, it's a short drive, it's great. It's so nice that we're starting to be able to mix and mingle a little bit more again. So hopefully people will take advantage of the opportunity. Back to your books one more time, I want to know from each of you what you hope people will take away most strongly when they've read the works that you've created. I think I want people to know that even in the depths of despair, there is always hope. I often tell my students, um, imagination um, is, the, uh, is the greatest um, antidote we have against despair. And I really do believe that, that your imagination can can allow you to free yourself from all kinds of demons. Uh, and I think one of the reasons I wrote this book was because of the mass shootings at Virginia Tech. And uh, it sent me to a place of, of real despair in lots of ways. Uh, and I wanted to make sure that that I found a way back that was real and quite terrible and horrific in many ways, but also uplifting and, and hope-filled because it seems to me that that's the, the most important thing we can hand on to others, especially as writers of color. You hand on hope. It's what we have to do. And so 
I really think we we make a future for young people that is better than the future that we have. Hmm. Yeah, that's, that's really beautiful. I agree. I agree. What what takeaway would you like for people to to gain to acquire from reading your work? I also, and I totally believe in hope. They say that romance is the genre of hope. And as a romance writer, also in addition to a fantasy writer, that that's always something um, that I'm dealing with. But I think also community and family, um, writing this novel about a specific black community, just, I, I would like people to take away the idea that they can be powerful actors in their community. That's something that I think we need more of. We need people to focus locally in addition to nationally, but um, you know, start in your own backyard and and look to see other, are there things that you can improve in your community and there are there ways to uh, just make things better because by doing that, well, it'll expand and, and branch out into this our nation and our world also. Mm -hmm. So hope goes hand in hand with that in my mind. And then back to the idea of the two of you being trailblazers, which you certainly are um, in the work at Virginia Tech, in uh, the work with your podcast, in the work uh, from your literary hands. Um, do you hope that maybe you'll inspire other writers as well? Absolutely. Oh, yeah. yeah I would definitely really hope so. <laughs> yeah. And of course, I work with writers that I helped launch the MFA program at Virginia Tech many years ago, and I still teach there. And uh, the young writers who are coming up today are extraordinary. And often they are fearless, too. And I love the fact that they'll try anything and that they're super interested in, in all kinds of different voices that they can try on. And I feel as though that, too, is a way for us to leap forward. If you try on other voices, then there's otherness that you'll listen to. And that's important. Mm. Yeah, the writers that were foundational for me, I know I do, I do teach at workshops uh, for writing groups around the country and at conferences and things, and just trying to give back because so many, you know, very generous people gave to me and taught me, and I, I do try to pay that forward. Hmm. No doubt you will get some questions about self-publishing because many people say, you know, I've got this book or I've got this story idea. Are, are you patient in indulging those questions? I talk about it a lot on my podcast and people do email me. I'm happy to point them to resources because I'm, I'm building something on my website, a resource list for self-publishing because it is a, you know, I found, I know a lot of self-publishers are very success, successful and it's, I think it's, you know, the, the stigma has, is almost gone by now. So yeah, I'm happy to help people point them in the right direction. <laughs> what about your works? What can we anticipate next from each of you? Well, I'm writing the third novel, which is called The Bird Tribe. Um, and uh, it's proven to be uh, a really, ex I mean, exciting to me. Like, I never know what my characters are going to do often, and they really surprise me. So I love it when they surprise me. And sometimes I'm horrified by them. Like, I say, how can you say something like that? But they still go ahead and do it. So uh, you do really have to listen well and, and be a good person to take dictation, I think, when you're a, when you're a novelist. Uh, but so it's called The Bird Tribe, and that hopefully will be done by the end of the year, sort of, hopefully. I think it will be. And then I'm also, we just got a deal for a children's book that I'll actually be illustrating because I'm an artist as well. So mm -hmm. that will be an exciting thing for me, something very different to be able to work without words. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. Oh, that's fantastic. So, um Leslie, so so you will be continuing with your science fiction series. Can we expect a departure like a children's book, perhaps, from you? No children's books in the works yet. Um, and my, the, work, the book that I'm working on now is another standalone. So The Monsters We Defy is actually a standalone. This is another focusing on a black town, you know, an all black town in the South that's being... Um, threatened by the construction of a dam and there's going to be a magical intervention. So I'm working on that. Hopefully that will be early 2024. I do have a, an urban fantasy series that started this year with a book called Savage City. And I'm working on the second book in that series, Beastly Kingdom, which is a more futuristic uh, dystopian urban fantasy series. So those are the things that are on the plate right now. <laughs> I'm interested too in um, uh, the, the authors that you, you read, the, um, who are you excited to see at the festival? What books are you excited to read next that are not your own? 
I know that um, Alex Jennings, who wrote uh, The Ballad of, of um, Perilous Graves, is going to be at the festival. And I am excited about that book that, that came out recently. Um, I have to look at the list again because there's, I was so excited about so many of the authors that are going to be there. I know Janelle Monae is going to be there in her anthology that came out recently. is just fantastic. Um, they really have uh, so many great, so many great authors that will be there that I, I can't wait to check out. Yeah. And, and I'm really looking forward to, I hope, being able to, apart from Kwame Alexander, of course, and Bakari Sellers, uh, Clint Smith, uh, how the word was passed. I've got that back there in, in my bookshelf. And uh, it's really a very, very interesting book. So those kinds of things are, are, are the things that I'm hoping to check out. But quite frankly, uh, Leslie is absolutely right. There is a plethora of amazing authors that they've got for the National Book Festival. So uh, the only difficulty is going to be trying to get to see all of them. And that will start. <laughs> right. Well, hopefully uh, we will all have time and hopefully I will have an opportunity to see each of you there, uh, maybe with my fantasy reading husband to discuss <laughs> Um, your wonderful works and thank you so much for for sharing those with us for sharing your talents with us for sharing your time with us today I think that we are almost to the point where we need to get Heather um, to come back to uh, talk with us about the the discussion and what our audience can anticipate as far as uh, the festival and the Library of Congress so thank you so much uh, both of you for, for sharing your wonderful selves with us today. Well, thank you, Angie, for moderating such thought-provoking questions. It's been so fantastic to be able to, to listen to this interview and get to get insights both into Leslie and Lucinda's work. I will say one of the most important things, well, hope and the future of our children and thinking about the work you're doing and the imagination you're stirring and enabling young people to think of what's possible and how the world should be and the world they want to create in the future. I mean, that, that to me, that theme is so beautiful. And, um, and yes, yeah, sometimes it's hard to, to get people to get there, but I'm excited about the work you've created and the challenges you bring forward that not everyone always wants to deal with. And, and I think that's what's great about the space you've created it in. It makes it easier to raise up some of those conversations. So this has been fantastic. I also want to point out Lucinda's comment about how hard it is to, to pick what you go to at the National Book Festival, at the Library of Congress National Book Festival. I will say, I went for my first time in 2019. It was amazing. Um, and being that so many people are able to drive, I, you know, I think there will be hundreds of thousands more people coming because it is so amazing. But I will say, plan ahead because they publish a schedule. You can go to loc.gov slash bookfest and you can plan what you want to do, what, what stage you want to go to, what room, plan out the map of how you're going to get there. It is such an amazing place to be. It is bringing us together, so many authors, so many book lovers, so many people who are, are going to have so much fun and learn and learn about their favorite author and their next favorite author and about subjects that interested them and didn't know were going to interest them. It is a great opportunity. Um, and once again, if you can't be there in Washington, DC, you can stream the main stage. And after the fact, things will be uh, live and you will be um, streamable. The other thing to note is we are having a series, we're having nine more of these conversations leading up to the National Book Festival. Um, so through August 31st, we are talking to people tomorrow night. We will be having a conversation um, with Juliet Menendez about um, her latest book with uh, South Florida PBS will be working with us on that. So don't forget to join in. Don't forget to be there. But most importantly, don't forget to plan what you're going to do because you get, oh, you're going to get overwhelmed and think, oh my gosh, there's this and this, and I want to go to both. And, and that's where Lucinda, you're going to have to divide and conquer with your husband yeah. or, or right now. I'm sorry for that. <laughs> you're going to have to divide and conquer with your husband. I'm sorry. My bad. 
it's so hard. Like it is so hard to choose. There are there's such an amazing array of of authors um, and and just people you want to hear from. And your people will be there. People who love learning, who and people from every walk of life. It is just a fantastic experience. So glad we could have this conversation today. So fortunate to have two trailblazers with us talking about their work. Um, we have to close the program, but I just want to thank both of all of you for joining us um, and remind people, check out the 2022 Library of Congress National Book Festival. Until next time, I'm Heather Marie Montilla. You're watching PBS Books and happy reading.